Hi, I'm John Strzelecki, and you're listening to Escape the Rat Race Radio. Welcome to episode 18 of Escape the Rat Race Radio. I'm your host, Christian Rodwell, and this is your ticket to escape the nine to five. Sometimes freedom simply means choosing to work in an industry that is much more in alignment with what I call your big five for life. And that's also freedom. So if you love kayaking on the weekends and you're in the accounting industry, hey, here's a crazy, wacky, original thought, but maybe try and get a job in the accounting department of a company that's in sports equipment, or even better, kayaks. What if we were to say, I'm going to figure out the five things that I most want to do, see, or experience in my lifetime before I die. The five things that are so powerful that if I did saw or experience them, that I could get to the end of my life and I could say that my life was a success as I defined success for myself. On today's episode of Skate the Rat Race Radio, I'm very pleased to welcome John Strelecki. Now, John is an American author, and if you haven't heard of John before or read any of his international best-selling books, then you're in for a treat. Now, I was first enlightened to John's work by my own personal business mentor, John Ketley, and John rated John Strzelecki's book as his number one personal development stroke business book of all time, and that was The Big Five for Life. So I read that book, and I instantly fell in love with that. And John Strzelecki has actually written eight books, and these are all based around your personal meaning of life and finding what it is that actually lights you up, that you will wake up every morning and wanting to just jump out of bed and get working on that or towards that goal. So John shares with us many, many fascinating stories, his own personal story of how he never actually intended to be an author. And it was after being in the rat race, taking time out to go traveling, And he was in Costa Rica where he had an epiphany moment and he sat down in front of his computer and something just took over him. He really got into flow and that was the beginning of his journey as an author. And his books have now been translated into over 20 languages worldwide. And he is someone who is a genuine good soul and I'm sure that you'll be able to identify with his message throughout this interview. So let's not wait around any longer. Let's head over to my interview with John Strzelecki. Welcome, John, to Escape the Rat Race Radio. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks, Christian. How are you? Um, absolutely awesome. Thank you. And whereabouts in the world are you right now? Uh, I'm home. I'm in Florida in the United States. Brilliant. And we had an attempt last week to get this podcast recorded. And I had literally just landed in Portugal myself, living the remote worker lifestyle. And I'm now one week into it. And I've managed to find myself a a half decent internet connection and uh, a room where I hopefully won't be disturbed throughout this conversation. (laughs) See, that just makes your story that much better. If it had all gone seamlessly, then there wouldn't have been anything to, uh, to share with the audience. That's true. That's true. And and you started to tell me last time about something to do with, you know, if you can't work in a t-shirt and flip-flops, then, you know, you (laughs) remind me of that. Uh, Yeah. So that's just, I mean, that's just my general life perspective. I spent so many years dressing for the cultural norm, you know, wearing a suit, wearing a tie, dress shoes and all the rest of that. And hey, if that's your thing, that's absolutely fantastic. But that is not my thing. And so For me, it's shorts, a t-shirt, and flip-flops, and the flip-flops are really the optional piece. If I can be barefoot, that's even better. So Cool. Yeah, well, I'm definitely rocking a similar style right now, so we're (laughs) on the same page today. (laughs) Cool. So, John, most people will recognize your name as as an author, uh, an author of four absolutely tremendous books. And I must admit, it's a bit of a guilty pleasure for me to have you on Escape the Rat Race Radio. Because it was my personal business mentor, John Ketley, who first enlightened me to your work. And he has a list of his top five business books ever. And there's some real big names in there, you know, things like Think and Grow Rich and and How to Win Friends and Influence People. But top of that list is your book. And that's The Big Five for Life. And I hadn't heard of this book before. And I, I was like, okay, well, I've got to go and read it. And of course, I did. And I absolutely fell in love with it. And I fell in love with the whole message behind it. So resonated with me um, about living your life on purpose. And if for those that haven't come across your work yet, um, what I'd love to do today in our conversation is really just kind of find out how this all came about for you. Because as far as I'm correct, you never intended to set out as an author. Is that right? 
no plans to be an author, not, not even remotely thinking that. Let's take things back then, I guess, John, to really a, a time when were you in the rat race yourself? And how do you define the rat race in your own terms? My definition of the rat race would be you are living, you're living by someone else's definitions. And so freedom to me is the ability to do what I want, when I want, in the way that I want. That's free of the rat race. Anything other than that means I'm in it. And I was in the rat race. I started working when I was 12 years old, doing the kind of jobs that, quite frankly, nobody wants to be doing. Very manual labor intensive, and I'm not a big guy. So it was very difficult. It was very physical labor. And I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. But that's where the game started for me. I stayed in the rat race and, and was in it until I escaped in my early 30s. I did eventually get myself out of physical manual labor jobs and did everything from you know sort of accounting work, working in an office. I had a dream to be a pilot. I went to school. I had sort of a personal travesty. I went to college, saved up all my money, worked two, three jobs. While I was at college, worked endless hours during my summers, all to get a degree and hopefully become an airline pilot for the only reason, and you'll laugh when you hear this, Christian. The only reason I wanted to be an airline pilot because I knew, A, they made good money, and B, they had a lot of time off, and C, they got free airline tickets. I know, I know, but it's like, you know, I look at it now and I'm like, wow, like I wish I'd had a mentor back then who could have said, okay, listen, John, what you really want is freedom, and you're choosing a path to get to that, but like there's a lot of paths to that freedom. But that was the only path I knew, and it sounded pretty good. And so I saved and saved and saved and worked super hard. And unfortunately, when I graduated college and got my shot at interviewing for the airlines, found out I had a heart condition that had never been diagnosed before. And so literally everything I'd saved, everything I'd worked for from the time that I was 12 years old was yanked out from underneath me in a heartbeat, just like that. So then I went the corporate route. I ended up getting my MBA and was wearing a suit and tie and traveling around the country offering advice. And you know, it was I was really good at it and I was very well paid for it. But quite honestly, I just kept thinking to myself, there has got to be more to life than this. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's funny you mentioned, there's a few things there I'd like to just pick up on. You You mentioned the word freedom several times. And in my feedback with members of Escape the Rat Race, when I ask people, what does Escape the Rat Race really mean to you? And the one word that comes up over and over again is always freedom. When you boil it down, um, I've actually kind of identified that there's, there's only really about five different freedoms. And for most people, it's time freedom, financial freedom, freedom of relationships, so who they spend their time with, who they choose to work with, freedom of location, being able to just travel and, and work wherever, and just freedom of choice, really. And would you have any to add to that at all in your experience? No, as you're describing your list, the only one that came to mind, but you sort of hit it with the freedom of choice is the freedom to think in my own way. And so if you are unfortunate enough to be in an environment where you are told what to think and how to think, that's very challenging. And as you look across human history, there's been plenty of those, especially in the last hundred years. And so it's an unbelievable gift to live in an environment where you can literally think thoughts that are your own without having someone drill them into you. That may be, out of everything, the most important one, to be honest with you. You started to describe what reminded me of how Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, talks about like the old way and the new way. The old way of being conditioned, going to school, all dressing up in a uniform. And we take that through into our working life, really, with us. And we're conditioned, the route we need to take is good education, then go and get a good job, hold in there for as long as you can until you get the pension and the gold watch. But that's the old way. And those days just are not there anymore, are they? You know, if you're very risk averse, maybe that path made sense because you didn't have a lot of options that you could see for yourself. You therefore were going to follow the, the pretty safe route. But as you just described, like I don't know anybody who's eligible for a pension anymore, at least not here in the United States. Companies just don't offer that. And so the dream now for most people is, yeah, they, they go to university, they're 22 years old, and they're going to suck it up and engage in and live in and deal with the rat race for the next 43 years until they hit the magical age of 65. And then... Finally, they get to retire and go do the things that they want to do. And unfortunately, that dream is just so filled with potholes along the way. And I'll tell you one of the statistics that absolutely blows my mind as it relates to that, being a guy. I was getting ready to do a TV interview and I was doing some research for it. I learned that one out of five men, almost one out of five, it's like 19 point something percent, doesn't even make it to age 65, like statistically in the human race. 
that means 20% of guys who are buying into that sort of process and protocol and timeline, they're never even going to make it. That is, that's something so flawed and nobody talks about that. Like I, that blows my mind. Yeah, that's a pretty heavy statistic, isn't it? Imagine you've, you know, you sucked it up, you wore the uncomfortable shoes and tie every day, and then you don't even get the payoff at the end for one out of five guys. Like, that's a staggering statistic. So the new way, really, and, and there's a real movement out there right now, which is the entrepreneur movement, which is about embracing the change, embracing all of the amazing opportunities that are now coming and through technology. And it's a double-edged sword, really, because, again, statistics out there will, will have us kind of believe that in the next five years, up to 50% of jobs that exist today may not be there. And robots and artificial intelligence and, and all of this future tech that's really coming in at a super fast pace now is going to really shake things up. And if you're not now really taking control of how you generate an income and, and really designing your life on purpose, which, you know, I believe is completely your message out there to the world, then it's a, it's a slightly risky game to be playing, isn't it? It's funny you mentioned the AI, like all of a sudden in the last nine to 12 months, it seems like that is the hotbed of conversation for people talking about what is the next wave of innovation. And, you know, we don't know yet what that's going to mean. Everybody is speculating and hypothesizing, but you're right. It could be a vast elimination of jobs. When I think back about a lot of the jobs I had, eliminating my job would have been a great thing because I couldn't stand the job anyway. Uh, it would have forced me into something else. But if you are the type of person who is looking for that security, then that's going to be a very scary time in life. I'm not sure that everybody needs or wants to be an entrepreneur. I love being an entrepreneur because I love the freedom. But I will throw this out there for the people who are in the listening audience. that Sometimes freedom simply means choosing to work in an industry that is much more in alignment with what I call your big five for life. And that's also freedom. So if you love kayaking on the weekends and you're in the accounting industry, hey, here's a crazy, wacky, original thought, but maybe try and get a job in the accounting department of a company that's in sports equipment, or even better, kayaks. And when I talk to people about that, they're like, oh my God, that's so obvious. And it is. Ask 100 people, ask 1,000 people, how many of them have that alignment? And you're going to find almost zero. And so I totally agree with you. I love the entrepreneurial lifestyle. I can't imagine ever going back to something that is not my own. However, I realize that's not everybody. And so my thought there is like, just sort of, if you're not interested in doing that, at least allow yourself the freedom to align your passions and your interests with the way that you spend nine to 10 hours a day in your job. I'm really glad you brought that up, actually, John, because escaping the rat race does not necessarily mean starting your own business for everybody. And nor does it mean that everyone, the entrepreneurship is right either. In fact, my guest on Escape the Rat Race Radio last week was Dr. John DiMartini whose work I'm sure you're familiar with. And he talks very strongly about really living to your truest and highest values. And you're right, if the values of a company are in line with your personal values, then, then that could be a fantastic partnership. Yeah, absolutely. Because not everybody wants to be the man or woman at the top with all their responsibility, quite frankly. And not everybody's brain is wired that that's the best use of their talents either. Yeah. So you touched on the big five for life there just now, John, and I definitely want to dive into that and really just learn more directly from you as to where all of that came from, you know, from inside, inside your head, because it's just such a tremendous, tremendous story. And before that, of course, that wasn't your first book. So your first book was The Why You Hear Cafe, which has become a number one bestseller. And there were three specific questions, if I'm correct, that you asked in that book. Would you mind sharing those with us? Yeah. So let me take you back just a touch because the entry point for that becoming a reality is a powerful example of what the world can look like when you step outside of the rat race and allow the world of flow to start taking you down a different river. And so I left everything behind in 2002 to go backpack around the world. And at the time, I was a consultant in a very successful consulting firm. My job consisted of providing strategic advice to companies. I was very good at it. I was highly paid for it, like I said earlier. But I just, I would get to the end of the week and I couldn't help but ask myself, if I continue to do this for the next five years, 10 years, will I be happy? Will I feel like that was a great use of my time? And despite the fact that I was treated very well by that company and greatly admired the guy who was in charge of it, the answer to that was no. It wasn't a job that I really felt that is my highest calling. Through a series of bizarre circumstances, the opportunity came and I took it to just 
get out. And so I left. And it was a leap of faith. And the vast majority of the people around me had the same opportunity and almost no one took it because fear set in. And I think the reason that I was able to do is because I had had a plan in place that in October of that same year, I was going to leave and leave for the reason that I wanted to wake up every day feeling excited. And so I had set that plan in motion. I was planning on October and this opportunity came up in February. And I just was like, well, it's really the same plan. I'm just accelerating the plan. So sure, I'll take it. And so for a year, backpacked around the world, and it was absolutely life-changing. I mean, I had dreamed about seeing the world since I was a little kid, and my parents introduced me to sort of local travel and a little bit of international travel. But this was strapping on a backpack where the only things you own can be stuffed into that pack between your butt and your head, and you are reliant on yourself in places where you don't speak the language, and you have to find food and shelter and get around. And I will tell you, Christian, as much as I have done amazing, fun things ever since that year, when I look back, that was probably the most fun I have ever had in my life because I had zero responsibilities and I was endlessly open to possibilities as I backpacked around the world. And it completely changed my life. And when I came back from that experience, I re-entered the rat race because I had no job, no money, and no specific plan, right? I had this amazing year of nirvana, but I had no plan after that. A buddy of mine had sent me an email and he's like, hey, I need a consultant. I know that you're just coming back. And is there any chance you could take this project when you got to lead it? And I was like, uh, yeah, okay. You know? And I was like, so, and by the way, I cannot stand cold weather. I do not do well in cold weather. And my entire year of, of backpacking around the world was in very nice warm climates. And so I sent him back an email. I was like, all right, so where's the engagement? And he's like, uh, it's in Detroit, Michigan. And this oh. is like January, you know? So it's like, oh, Seriously, no, right? So everything that almost killed me emotionally, physically before, I am now allowing myself to step back into because I don't have a plan. And so I take the job and I do it for a few months and like it is everything that I had left behind. You know, it's it's people whose biggest concern is whether they sell three more widgets to this clientele. And I just spent the year meeting people who are scrambling to survive on a dollar a day. So it's just like this massive disconnect of, oh my gosh, how can that be your primary concern? Do you know what else is going on in the world? And oh, by the way, why am I even judging you? Because if I don't like it, I should just get the heck out. So I get to my last day of the engagement. I'm ready to come home. I'm on my flight. I'm sitting there and my flight gets delayed. And I know that you're a traveler too, Christian, so you can appreciate this. It's like rule number one, right? You never don't have a book or something to entertain yourself in case this happens. Well, lo and behold, I'd finished my book the night before. And I was running to catch my flight. I had nothing. So I'm sitting there on the plane with nothing to do for an indefinite amount of time on the tarmac. And something told me to start writing out a speech. And as you alluded to earlier, like I had no training as an author. I definitely had no training as a speaker. But I was coming off of that year of backpacking around the world and understanding the power of flow and trusting your instincts. I was like, all right, I don't know why, but it's telling me to start writing. So I start writing. What it ended up being was a speech about, it was a speech to high school students in my head. And it was about like, how do you deal with these two worlds? So the world of the rat race and then this world of nirvana that I just came back from after a year of traveling around the world. So I got home. I didn't think about it. It was just a way to fill my time. I wake up the next morning and something said, there's way more to it than that. And so I sit down at a computer. I had what I call stream of conscious typing experience. And so for 21 days, I just sat and typed and it just came through me and flowed through me. I never thought about what I was going to type. I never read what I'd typed the day before. I never pre-planned everything. I just typed and typed and typed. And at the end of 21 days, I put it on a shelf and let it sit there for a week, came back Write it after the week, and what was in there is almost word for word what is in my first book called The Y Cafe, and that's the story of how that book came to be. That is some amazing story. <laughs> that is some amazing story. And so at the end of those 21 days, the first time you'd obviously just flowed in that way, did you feel then that was a shift where there was kind of no turning back? Did you feel then you were an author or had it not really kicked in still at that stage? No, I, I really can't say that it kicked in or that I even knew what was happening or why it was happening. I just knew that something told me this is the right path, you know? And again, had I not spent the year backpacking around the world and being a hundred percent in tune with trusting my instincts, you know, cause again, when you're in places that you don't speak the language and you, you have to sort of get the basics out of life, you start tapping into way more than just your sort of core skill set, you know? And so I was still in that zone, understood the the importance of appreciating that zone. And I just trusted that this felt right, seemed right. This was the right thing to do. 
I will say this though. So there was a beautiful point at which the worlds interconnected. So I had 21 days to sort of stream a conscious type it a week on the shelf. Then I go back and read it and it looked like a book. It felt like a book, right? And so to your question, I don't think at that point I even remotely considered myself an author, but I did realize like this has the basis of a book or it feels like a book. And so then that left brain consulting life of mine kicked in and I was like, so what would it take to actually make this a book? Mm. And so that was going to be my next question. What were the steps? Right. So, and this is going back a bunch of years, right? This is 2003 when I first wrote it. And so back then you just had a few options. You had try and get it published by a mainstream publisher, start your own publishing company or do what was called vanity press where no matter what you typed on the pages, they'll print it and make it look like a book. You know, I figured out sort of the ins and outs of the publishing world in about three days because I treated it like a consulting project. Like I used to have to do when I was doing that kind of work consulting. And so that was kind of cool because that was a moment where I realized, you know what, if I didn't have that as part of my story, I could never do what I'm about to do. And what I did fast forward and sort of give you the 30 second synopsis is I started a publishing company. I published that book. It sold 10,000 copies in the first like nine months. I got picked up by a literary agent out of New York. Translate that. The book is now in 28 languages. It's been a bestseller on three different continents. It was bestseller of the year, the last two years in Europe and will be probably this year as well. And I'm currently working on the movie deal for the Y Cafe. So thank goodness I had the business background that I had to sort of walk me through that entry point. And it has guided me through this entire experience as an author too. Um, But I was able to blend it with the creative intuitive part that came about because I followed my instincts and traveled the world. That, that, that's truly amazing. And then congratulations, obviously, on the movie as well. It's forthcoming. That's certainly something I'll be looking out for. So that kicked things off. And remind us again, what year was that when that was first written? Yeah, so I had the stream of conscious typing experience in 2003. I think the very first edition of the book in English came out that year. And then it was over the next, gosh, I don't know, like I'm still I'm still writing deals. At some point, my agent and I parted ways, grateful for everything she did for me. And then she retired. So I took everything over on my own. And again, like, thank goodness for my business background, because without that, there's no way I could have done it. But the book, we just signed a contract recently for, I think, Albanian or Hungarian So the book is still, you know, many years after it was originally written, still being translated and published in different languages. Is The Y Cafe still your best-selling book or has The Big Five for Life overtaken that? So The Y Cafe is still the best-selling book in part because it has a multi-year advantage time-wise, you know, so it's just been out quite a bit longer. I don't know if The Big Five for Life will eventually overtake it. It may. Since it had that sort of running start, it may always keep the lead. Now, The Big Five for Life, if I'm correct, was actually your third book. So there was one in between that as well, which was Life Safari. Correct. Yeah. As a matter of fact, so you had alluded to earlier writing four books. I've actually written eight at this point. Okay. Yeah. So there is a sequel to The Big Five for Life book and there is a sequel to The Y Cafe. So yeah, I wrote The Y Cafe, then I wrote Life Safari, then I wrote The Big Five for Life, then I wrote the sequel to The Y Cafe, then the sequel to The Big Five for Life, and co-authored a book called How to Be Rich and Happy. And then did two other books after that. Yeah. I know for a guy who had no training and no plans to be an author, it's uh, been a heck of a ride, I can tell you that. Oh, absolutely. And so just sort of finalizing on the Y Cafe there, really, you were asking the question, what's the meaning of life? And, and there were three specific questions. Why are you here? Do you fear death? And are you fulfilled? Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. So a guy is... 28 years old and you know his life isn't bad his life is just sort of fine so his job is fine his life is fine and he's asking himself isn't there more than this and heads off on a driving trip and gets hopelessly lost and finds this little cafe and on the cafe menu there are those three questions and his initial response is like what the heck is that right (laughs) because it's not it's not the kind of questions that you get every day it's not the kind of things people talk about uh, with each other but he stays in the cafe and starts having conversations with the people that are there and by the time he leaves the next morning he has a completely different perspective about life overall and certainly about his life in particular I'd like to fast forward then to The Big Five for Life, because as I mentioned earlier, this was number one in the list of books that you must read from my mentor, John Ketley. And so The Big Five for Life, which is leadership's greatest secret. And would you mind sharing a little bit without giving the story away too much, obviously, for anyone who hasn't yet read the book, but just to give people an idea about how that came about and just the the kind of backbone throughout that story. 
so what happened is I the Y Cafe was released and it it took on a life of its own. It really did. You know, we were taking orders from around the world when it was just in English and people were referring it. So what happened is I started to get asked to speak. And like I said, I had no plans or training to be an author, let alone a speaker. And so the idea of actually standing on a stage and talking to people was terrifying for me. I didn't know what I was going to talk about. You know, I'm just me. What, <laughs> what, what do I have to share, right? So I was thinking about it and reflecting on it. And then one day I was literally in the shower, which God knows why, but that is when some of my great inspirations strike me and I have nothing to write with. And if I don't write it down and then it's gone by the time I'm drying myself off, but I'm in the shower and I'm thinking about, okay, I've got this speaking engagement that I've agreed to. And what am I going to talk about? Because I want it to be inspiring. I want it to be powerful for the audience. And all of a sudden it flashed back to me when I was in Africa as part of my travels around the world which was one of the places that was the most life-changing for me. When you're in Africa and you're on safari to see animals, everyone talks about something called the African Big Five. And it's five specific animals that everyone wants to see. And they gauge the success of their safari experience based on these five animals. And so if you only see two of the five, it's like, whoa, that was just, you know, that was just okay. You see three, better, four, we're getting close. And five, you see all five of the African Big Five, it's like nirvana. You know, like that, whoa, that's exactly what I came here for. I was thinking about this speaking event and reflecting on that. And all of a sudden, this flash came to me that what if we were to look at our lives that way? What if we were to say, I'm going to figure out the five things that I most want to do, see, or experience in my lifetime before I die? The five things that are so powerful that if I did saw or experience them, that I could get to the end of my life and I could say that my life was a success as I defined success for myself. And I'll, I'll tell you, Christian, when I had the flash, when I had the insight, I, you know, I got the, the physical response. You know, I just got chills. I got like goosebumps. And I was like, okay, that's it. Like there's something yeah. very powerful there. And I know it sounds super simple. I, like I have shared that and taught that. And now there are courses where people spend two days getting immersed and discovering their big five for life. And those courses are taught around the world. Like there is something so simple, but so true in this experience of knowing those five things. And I'll tell you why I think it's so powerful for myself and for people that come across it and it resonates with them is because Every day, we are bombarded with 50 million things trying to get our time and attention. I mean, my gosh, how many emails and texts and you go to a website and you can't even look at the content you want because there's so much advertising and it's everywhere. Someone is trying to capture your, your energy, your flow, your time every second of the day. And so the question is, how do you deal with that in a way that keeps you sane? And the answer is... When you know the five things that you want to do, see, or experience in your lifetime before you die, the things so powerful that if you did saw or experience them, that on your deathbed, you could say for yourself, not based on anybody else's standards, but your own standards, my life was a success. Then all the rest of that stuff just becomes quiet. <laughs> it's, it's the most awesome thing ever. You stop seeing the rest of it. You stop hearing the rest of it. Because your mind and your antenna becomes tuned to those five things and you become like a homing beacon to the universe. Mm -hmm. I know that may sound crazy to some people, but in, if, if someone is religious, you can substitute the, the word of your choice there, whether it's God or spirituality, whatever. But it's like when you get that clear, it's almost like the universe says, Christian, dude, we have been waiting for this. Thank goodness. Now that you're that clear. All the resources in the world are going to align to help you, dude. And, and it happens. And it happens in ways and at speeds that you cannot possibly imagine. And it's the coolest thing ever. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with John Strelecki and learned as much from that as I did. And I find it fascinating, and I hope you do too, that the common seed that runs through all of these interviews with all of these successful entrepreneurs, people who are truly living their life on purpose, is that it really does all begin with the end in mind. Really taking time to plan how you want your life to look. And John Ketney, my business mentor, always says, what does winning look like to you? Have you actually figured that out for yourself? And this is really the, the foundation, I think, of all of John Strzelecki's work. And if you haven't read any of his books, then definitely get out there and get yourself a copy, whether it's the physical book or an audio book. I'd highly recommend either starting with The Why Cafe or The Big Five for Life. But definitely check them out because John will go through why you need to figure out what it is that's actually driving you, what is making you get out of bed every morning. And it's different for all of us. And if you heard the interview with Dr. John Demartini, he just worded it slightly different in terms of being clear on your values. 
Because when you understand what is the most important thing in your life, whether it's family, whether it's education, whether it's building wealth, or just the, the freedom, just the location of where you are, just being able to get up and be free to go and work wherever you want and travel whenever you want. Whatever it is to you, you need to be clear about that. Because then that's like your North Star. As Roger Hamilton says, you know, you need your North Star, which is where you are, who you are. And then the South Pole, the opposite of that is really understanding your customer. So these two things then will create the roadmap. And then it's just about putting the steps in place to get you from where you are now to where you want to be. So I hope once again, you enjoyed today's Escape the Rat Race radio. And if you did, please head over to iTunes or Google Play to leave us a positive review and share this with your friends. I'd really appreciate that. If you want to find out more and check some of the previous episodes, then head over to the Escape the Rat Race website which is www.etr.online forward slash podcast. And you can catch up with all of the other interviews right there. So wishing you a wonderfully, purposefully and passion-fueled week ahead. Until I see you next time, take care.